Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. We are continuing our short series about the gods in every man coming from the book of the same title by Jean Shinoda Bolin. We've been talking about the goddesses in every woman in the three-part series. Now we're in the middle of a series here talking about the gods in every man, the archetypes, the masculine archetypes that show up in men's lives. And in the last two podcasts, we talked about the father god archetypes in the first one, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. In the last episode, we talked about two of the sun god, S-O-N, sun god archetypes of Apollo and Hermes. Now, that episode was talking about the sun gods that were favorited sons, as far as all the archetypes go. In this one, we're going to talk about the two sons that were rejected sons. These are the rejected sons of Zeus. And these two gods are Ares and Hephaestus. So one of the recommendations I would make to you listening is to go back and listen to the first two podcasts in this Gods and Every Man, because it's going to give you a framework for what we're talking about today, because we're going to jump right into the middle of this discussion, assuming you've already heard those two podcasts. So if you're a new listener, I'd recommend you go back and catch yourself up to today's show so you can be on top of what's happening today in this discussion. So in the last episode, when we talked about the favored sons of Apollo and Hermes, one of the reasons why they were favored is because they took after Zeus. They're more thinking types. They are more emotionally disconnected and distant. Um, They're mentally active. They shy away from reactivity and they shy away from like physical things, like um, like fights and that sort of thing. They're more they're more strategic, and they negotiate their way through life. In this episode, we're going to talk about the two rejected sons of Ares and Hephaestus, who almost more mirror Poseidon in that sort of emotional depth way. There's a lot of emotionality to both Ares and Hephaestus, but it's quite sublimated and. Poseidon, as with all the father gods, the father gods don't look to others for approval. That's kind of what makes them the father gods versus the sun gods. The father gods are more self-referential. They're doing what makes sense to them. And while we did talk about a bit of sublimated emotionality in Poseidon, Poseidon isn't doing this to seek approval necessarily. He's just trying to navigate his way through a world that has a tendency to reward more thinker styles in men. But Ares and Hephaestus are both sun gods, so they are looking for approval. They are seeking approval, and their rejected status ends up coloring many aspects of this archetype's life. A lot of how they show up, maybe even were created to begin with, are based on their rejected status. And so this is more of sort of like going down the Poseidon road than it is going down the Zeus road. So let's talk about Ares first. Now, Ares is known as the god of war. He's a warrior, a dancer, a lover. He's shown to be exhibiting physical masculine power. It's this warrior ethos. Kind of imagine, in fact, he's depicted in full armor often, the helmet of armor, or the helmet with full armor holding a sword. Very warrior-like, very strong masculine and muscular. And Ares is the least respected of all the gods. He's the one that's marginalized and respected the least because of how he shows up. His genealogy, his origin story, is he's the only son of Hera and Zeus. So now Hera had uh, another child, you know, through basically like a virgin birth, but Ares was her only natural born child. As a boy, he was almost killed by two giant twins. In fact, he was imprisoned in a jar and his brother Hermes, his half-brother Hermes, had to come and rescue him so he wasn't killed. So from the time he was very young, he was targeted and almost killed, and he was already imprisoned as a boy. And then he went to train to be a warrior. But before he was trained to be a warrior, he actually learned the art of dance. And then from learning the art of dance, then he transitioned into being trained as a warrior. He had a tense and difficult relationship with his sister Athena, who often, from the stories, mistreated him or marginalized him or made fun of him. She even wounded him once. And when he made his appeal to Zeus and said, hey, one of my half-sister Athena hurt me, Zeus basically sided with Athena and sided against Ares. So Ares felt very rejected from that. And this added to the humiliation of already being wounded by his half-sister. 
His father rejected him in this process. He also had lots of children, and he was very protective of them. Because of his nature of being that passionate warrior, dancer, lover, he had a fiery nature to him, a very passionate in the moment nature. And this caused him to have multiple liaisons with multiple children springing up from them. But he was very protective of his children. He took care of making sure they were protected and were not exploited and would get very angry if any exploitation happened. Yeah. What's interesting is that he was the least respected. Well, it sounds like, I don't know if it was respected, but he definitely was the least, yeah, maybe the least respected and honored of the Olympian gods for the Greeks. But by the time the Romans came around, he actually became one of the most respected with the exception of Zeus. The Romans called Ares Mars. And Mars almost took the position that Apollo did for the Greeks. He was the favored son in the Roman um, concept of this pantheon of Olympic gods. So he changed, like like the per- people's perception of him changed over time, which is really interesting. And kind of later on when we talk about the growth of Ares is important. The other thing that I thought was really a standout is despite the fact that he was so berated so frequently for being, you know, sort of this run and gun, passionate, you know, jump in the fray um, of the Trojan War god. And that's really where this negative view of Ares comes mostly from Homer's depiction of him in the Trojan War. And Ares fought on the side of the Trojans who lost. And Boleyn mentions that probably is one of the reasons why he's given such a bad rap is that he was on the side of the loser. So, of course, the winners always get to write how everything went down. And Athena berated him on a number of occasions because Ares would run into the fray, which they were all told not to do in Trojan War. The gods were not supposed to meddle personally. I mean, they meddled all the time in the war, but they weren't supposed to personally take up arms and fight in the Trojan War. But when Ares' son was killed in the war, then he took up arms and went and fought. And so Athena called him hot-headed. And she berated him a lot for, you know, not following orders and not for being strategic, but for running in there and doing sort of a run and gun. And what's so interesting about that is, as you mentioned, this was in behalf of protecting his children. And another story of his is that he protected his daughter Alcipe when she was raped. Now, we've already talked about how the gods are and goddesses, like rape is a part of all of these people's stories. <laughs> like, it's almost like it didn't mean, it's like, is, does that mean what we think it means? <laughs> but then, of course, we're also talking about murders and death and all sorts of intense things that I feel like it's important to reconceptualize for a modern world when looking at these archetypes. But then you get to Ares, and Ares did not allow his daughter to be, when she was raped, he did not allow that to just go. Like, he killed the person who raped her. It was one of, I think it was Poseidon's sons that raped Elsipe. And so then when she, when he killed that the, um, Poseidon's son, then Poseidon took him before Zeus in the council and basically put him on trial for it. And then he ended up getting acquitted. So it was like, well, you're not allowed to kill my son for raping your daughter. And that didn't matter to Ares. Ares did it anyway and was put on trial for that. And for, you know, fortunately, he was acquitted. But it shows that he didn't have the same opinion of this as you know the other gods did at the time. And in fact, of all the gods, he's the only one that isn't shown to be exploitative in this way. He's called the lover. And the reason why he's called the lover is in, in none of his stories is he exploiting women. In none of his, ex- his stories is he taking advantage of, and and tricking or raping or coercing a woman into a relationship with him. In fact, he had so many children because his his relationships and his lover relationships oftentimes ended up in more than one child. So it shows that he ended up in relationships over the course of a long time with each of these women. So his ethos, you know, his persona or ethos that came out was very passionate, intense, and physical. Sometimes he was called the father of victory, the helper of justice, the helper of mankind. These are really positive attributes. This almost warrior, someone that goes to bat for the underdog aspects of him. He was depicted as a bloodthirsty warrior sometimes. And his half-sister Athena, like we mentioned, is was always belittling him, calling him names, basically calling him blockhead. Or She basically didn't have a very high opinion of his intelligence. She saw him as hot-headed and irrational and emotive and erratic 
but not very thoughtful or strategic like she was. So he would react emotionally, get into, you know, basically bar fights of the time, quote unquote, and fight back to protect his honor because he had almost this nature of always feeling like he had to protect his honor or stand up for himself in a way or the people that were close to him. And that expression, that hot-headed expression could sometimes come out as that like bar fight, you know, brawler type persona or the hero that would go to bat and save the underdog and fight for somebody that was being hurt or exploited. So this... This expression of his nature could go either way, depending on how it manifested itself. He was a passionate, physical lover. And when we talk about Dionysus, Dionysus was also a lover, but it was more in an ecstasy, cerebral, tantric sort of way. Whereas Ares was a passionate lover, but it was much more in a physical, tangible sort of way. And he was also depicted as a dancing warrior. So this, this moving warrior that was in touch with his body that could dance. You know, almost think of like... I think of a football, like a, uh, a wide receiver football player, someone who could dance and score offense on the other team by leaping in the air and catching a ball out of the air and then falling into the end zone or plowing through a, a, you know, the, op- the opposing team line of defense to score that touchdown. You kind of see this show up in that, that type of athlete. Yeah, isn't it kind of like uh, not uncommon for football players to take ballet lessons? Yeah, in fact, one of the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, Lynn Swan, used to take ballet he was a wide receiver, and that's that's one of the things that made him an excellent wide receiver is he was able to jump and move and dance. And yes, it's, it is something that they often will do. Uh, Zeus, his father, hated him, though. Ares was hated by his father. And it was because, very similar to Athena, this hot-headed, impulsive nature. You know, Zeus is steady, looking over the entire realm from Mount Olympus and thinking of long timelines and strategy. And, and here's this Ares character who... You know, this son who is bombastic and, and impassioned and can just lose his mind at any moment and get into fights and brawls. And this is just very distasteful to Zeus. So even though Ares had a sense of protector energy and there were a lot of good traits, he was rejected by a lot of his siblings. He was rejected by certainly his father. Athena rejected him and belittled him. And his dad, Zeus, also uh, belittled and rejected him. But there's a little bit, and it almost sounds like we're talking about a Poseidon-type character, right? You know, like Poseidon had a lot of this brooding under the surface. But one of the distinctions that Bolin makes in her book between the Poseidon fiery, explosive energy that can come out and Ares is Ares was a live and let live, a very non-judgmental and would not hold grudges, whereas Poseidon was a little bit more grudge-holding, vindictive. And Ares had a tendency to, if someone wronged him, get impassioned in the moment, protect his honor in the moment. But once the the intensity of the moment subsided. It was like, you know what? Never mind. I don't need to go and get retribution or have any have any vindication over that person to protect my honor. It was more, more of in the moment, rising up and feeling impassioned, but not something that he held on to and would exhibit over time. Yeah, I was. I think the biggest difference between Poseidon and Ares is that Poseidon is, as a father god, he's got more of a king energy, and so he's more of a um, he's he's more of a sort of an emotionally reactive, in a position of power, sort of like a, a feels like it's his right to be emotionally reactive. Whereas Ares is sort of a, he's almost like I don't want to say a prisoner, although he can become a prisoner if. Um, if he's still, quote unquote, stuck in the jar that he was put in. But uh, it's more like he's just really sort of impulsive. He's sort of like more physically, it's more of a physical impulsiveness than it is necessarily an emotional impulsiveness. And that physical impulsiveness can oftentimes be coupled with an emotionality, right? A sense of justice or, you know, rooting for the underdog or, when it, you know, getting upset and, and kind of running in with a with a sword into the war when he wasn't supposed to and that sort of thing. But it's more of a reactiveness. I see it as a difference between sort of an extroverted feeling Poseidon style versus like if you're looking at cognitive functions in the Myers-Briggs system, more of like an extroverted sensing um, style for Aries. It's more of like being in his body and the reactivity that comes from being in your body and not really thinking through your choices than it is sort of an emotional, um, you know, place of needing to express your emotions. But of course, uh, Aries does also need to be able to be expressive in that way. There are going to be emotions that are associated with extroverted sensing or that physical reactivity. And those emotions need to be able to be um, uh, communicated. And and some of that is just a desire for sensuality. Like the, uh, the 
Boleyn talks about this idea of being stuck in a jar, you know, the twins that put Aries in a jar. And he was in there for like 13 months and he was about dead, which she mentions is kind of interesting considering that he was an immortal god. But he was almost he was just about dead when Hermes came and found him and saved him from that jar. And she indicates that that jar can be the jar that an Aries man puts himself into when he wants to be physically expressive, but the world around him is very Zeus-like. The sort of patriarchal sky god, you know, system that makes it so that physical express- expressiveness is seen as distasteful. So the desire for a hug or the desire to wrestle, right? Um, you know, physically wrestle with his father to feel that physical bonding or closeness or the desire to throw his arm around, you know, like a guy friend's shoulders to show like a buddy feel. This is less about the emotional component of it than it is about the physical expressiveness that can be seen just as distasteful as the emotionality. And if he feels like he's not able to do that, do you know, express what's going on for him, including physical, you know, emotional things, then he might feel like he's been put in a jar and he sort of slowly dies inside over time. And especially if it's combined with a rejected nature, right? Like he's sort of just letting him, his identity die over time. And, um, and this desire to, to, to be physically expressive then ends up becoming, it almost becomes like he's a, a, a thinker in, uh, in sheep's clothing. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like, or no, excuse me, to be the opposite. It'd be a feeler in thinker's clothing. He acts like he's not emotional. He acts like he's not sensual. He acts like he's above it all. But what ends up happening is his body betrays him because he's such a kinesthetic character. So when he does get mad, instead of exploding like maybe a Poseidon character would, he's, he in, in, um, instead like clenches his jaw or tightens his fist or gets really kind of sort of uh, like he harbors it all in his muscles. And so he's not actually, Ares characters can be less emotionally explosive than Poseidon characters can be. Ares can be more sort of like wrapping it up in their muscles. And, um, and of course, over time, that is very dangerous to an Ares body because they should be very in touch with their feelings and their, and their sense feelings, right? Their kinesthetic sense um, receptors. They should be very in touch with it. But if that is all attached to behaviors that he that the Aries character has been told are wrong, then he'll push it away and push it away. And then it ends up becoming sort of like this, again, that sublimated anger, that um, unacceptable expressiveness that he only allows himself to show when he thinks he has permission, like when he's defending somebody's honor or, you know, like anything that society has said that that's an, uh, that's an acceptable time to do that. Um, so Aries characters can find themselves really struggling to be able to engage and um, interact with the world in a way that makes sense for them, that they're always trying to do it in a way that they've been told is acceptable. And so if they are somebody who's like a dancer, right, or somebody who is uh, an athlete or somebody who is, you know, like really good at being inside their body, if the world hasn't, they're not in a world that's constructed to allow them to show those elements of themselves, then they can get really sort of depressed and get really, um, you know, like like re- a lot of feelings of regret, or they should have been something else. Um, senses that they're not acceptable in this world, so they sort of force themselves into physical jobs, like blue collar jobs that may or may not be right for them. And it's usually because what they were intended to be, they never felt there was a place for them to be that thing. Yeah, and is Aries? Let's talk about Aries expressed as an actual man. So this energy showing up in a man in real life, often this is going to be a boy that was very emotionally expressive and emotional, but was given the message that that's not very appropriate. So, you know, they get to grade school and this is the type of boy that's going to have a very difficult time sitting by a desk and doing book learning. This is not how this boy's mind is wired. This is a physical boy, someone that wants to be out physically testing limits of things, physically using strength, physically trying and testing things in the outer world in a physical way. Learning by doing is how this boy probably learns the best. And so it would be my perspective that this is the most likely type of archetype to show up that's going to be put on drugs in order to sedate them in school to make them fit the Apollo model of going, you know, getting an education, sitting and studying carefully and following in a logical sequence. This is probably going to be the type of kid that's told they have ADHD or something like this and has to be behavior controlled all the time, always getting in trouble, going to the principal's office, getting in fights at school, because it's hard for them to sit still and listen and pay attention. 
Yeah, I I just want to make a comment that she talks about this boy as being emotional, but I actually think the better words are impulsive and spontaneous combined with emotional, like an emotional component. So this isn't a brooding emotionality. This is a like a, a spontaneous, impulsive, kinesthetic combined with an emotional piece. So if they're able to be in a context that's good for them, they're actually going to probably be pretty happy. Like the emotionality isn't going to be sort of that like emo brooding emotionality it's going to be emotionally expressive like positive and happy and joyful and cheerful but needing to be very physically expressive needing to run a lot needing to engage learning by doing like you mentioned yeah and that could be also channeled to athletics or the arts or dance i mean there's all sorts of ways to channel that energy it doesn't have to be just suppressed or uh you know marginalized there's ways for a Aries boy or child or young man to be able to channel that to positive positive ways. Uh, this is not going to be an easy kid to raise, though. It's going to need he is going to need a lot of attention and channeling from his parents to know how to take all that energy inside of him and find good outlets for that. Uh, peer groups are going to be very important for an Aries man as he's growing up. It's important for him to have that sense of camaraderie of that. A lot of times for other guys, that guy culture, that connection to other men of bros, you know, these guys that he can count on and that can count on him in a sense. Uh, this is very important for him. And in, especially through his teen years, as the testosterone starts to kick in after puberty, there's going to be a lot of aggressive nature. So having that tribe of other guys that he can rely upon and test himself against helps forge him in his teen years. So he's not overreaching. He's got some throttling of that. He can test his mettle against you know, other young men his age. There can be competitiveness. And again, if it could be channeled into athletics or healthy competition, this could be a really healthy channel and a healthy growth path for an Aries man as he's growing up. Often as a, an adult, an Aries man is attracted to physical active jobs. So you know, jobs that require working with his hands or getting getting physical or making things happen in the outer world. Movement. Sitting at a desk is probably not going to be typical of a, of a fully expressed Aries man. He's going to want to be active and moving and doing something that is tangible and real in the outer world. Sometimes this can also lead to soldiering, like literally going and signing up for the military, becoming a soldier. There's probably a lot of Aries men represented in the military and this is another pathway to channel that warrior ethos, working with your hands, doing something physical, and pushing yourself in a lot of ways in, the, you know, in your life, as well as athletics. Football players, basketball players, baseball, all sorts of different sports lend themselves to Aries men who can channel all that energy, all that intensity, and all that competitive spirit into something proactive. So you're going to see this show up in a lot of athletes as well. However... Aries men don't typically think about the future as much. They're very much here and now living in the present, which is great in a lot of contexts. That's really a good trait. That can be a good trait to think about the here and now and the present. However, if you're not thinking about the future enough, life can happen to you as an Aries man. So sometimes uh, relationships or marriages can just kind of happen to the Aries man. They're like, wait, how did I end up getting married? This just kind of, I was in the moment, there was some passion here, and now all of a sudden I find myself in this long-term relationship. And then all of a sudden there's some passion and excitement, and all of a sudden now there's a child, and now there's another child. And it's almost for the Aries man looking back to go, how, how did I get here? I wasn't really paying attention. I wasn't thinking about the future. I was just in the moment. I was passionate. And now I'm in these relationships. I have a, a, a relationship and children, and I'm not exactly sure how that came to be. And so life can often happen to you as an Aries man because you're so present in the moment, which again, it can be a really good thing, but you got to temper that with something about looking for things into the future as well to be able to make good decisions for yourself and not just let decisions happen to you. Yeah. Impulsiveness seems to be the Achilles heel of the Aries man. That's usually the biggest challenge. The dumb, when, when an Aries man makes dumb decisions... Um, that's oftentimes it's an impulsiveness or an in the moment that they just weren't thinking through it. Now, Aries had a romantic relationship with Aphrodite, right? They had a very passionate relationship. And that, and we could talk a little bit about that relationship in specificity, but I want to point to an example of that in popular, somewhat popular culture, but from my old, uh, my old Christian days. If you look in the Old Testament, there's a great example of an Aries character in the, in the person of Samson. 
who was a very Aries man. He was very impassioned. He was very in the moment. He was very strong. He was a warrior. And he entered into this relationship, this dynamic relationship. He almost let it happen to him, in a way, with a Aphrodite character, who was the person of Delilah, who ended up seducing him and tricking him. Now, that's not always a characteristic of Aphrodite, but it was in this case, where he was so taken up with the passionate relationship that he allowed the relationship to happen to him, where she kept attempting to deceive him, and he would allow this to happen, and hot-headed, he would fight off whoever she brought in to take advantage of him, until eventually she was able to deceive him to the point where he was overtaken, and it ruined his life, basically, because he wasn't paying attention. He wasn't paying attention to his passion. He wasn't paying attention to the nature that he was showing up with, and he wasn't certainly thinking about his future. He was just living in the present, to the point where, remember that live and let live, he kept forgiving her over and over again, for kind of screwing him over. And he wasn't thinking in terms of, hey, if I keep letting her do this, it's not going to work out well for me. So I think the person of Samson in the Old Testament of the Bible is a really great example of an Aries character, maybe in a not helpful way, where it, 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 he got taken advantage of, it didn't work out well for him. He was exploited because of his here and now present moment nature. There's another character in the Bible too that I think is also an Aries that uh, was a little bit different in how he manifested was King David, I believe was an Aries character. King David, there's actually a story in the Bible talking about King David stripping down naked. After winning battles and being a warrior, he stripped down naked in Jerusalem and danced through the streets to express himself. Very physical. He was a brawler. He would get impassioned and angry at moments and lash out. But he also kind of had this nature of live and let live. And I think he's another Aries character from the Bible that was this warrior king that was also a dancer and lover. And you can kind of see Aries expressed in him in a little bit of a different way than Samson. Yeah. I In modern uh, fiction, I think Jamie Lannister from the Game of Thrones series is probably an Aries character. And he also kind of lets, he lets his sister Cersei, who he's in a relationship with and an incestu- incestuous relationship with, he kind of lets her screw him over, <laughs> over and over again too. Um, and, but it can go the other way. Aries men, if they have been abused, can go the other way and become abusers. And the challenge is that if they've lost touch with that emotional aspect of themselves, the like the subjective aspect that helps them remember how they're feeling, if they feel like their feelings have been stamped down over and over and over again to a place where they can't even remember who they are or have no sort of relationship with their subjective experience then they can become abusers because they can't sympathize with what the abused person is going through. So sometimes they can be on the, 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 it's not uncommon for them to enter abusive relationships, whether they're being abused or doing the abusing, because they have gotten disconnected from who they are. And so they're not really kind of paying attention to the dynamics of the relationship and the impulsiveness ends up coming out as either receiving or, or being on the, the giving end of the abuse, which is really sad. Uh, I was thinking back to you talked about sort of uh, Aries men being part of bro culture. And I think what's interesting about this and, and in particular, you know, looking at all of these through the lens of, of as you know, myself being a woman and hearing Boleyn's take on a lot of this through uh, the lens of maybe second wave feminism and starting to see sort of the social culture shifting once again. And then um, I think I think we're in it like, I don't know if it's been called another wave of feminism, but it kind of feels like we're in a new wave of social progress. And I've noticed that the, the concept of bro culture is very much seen as um, anathema to a lot of women. Like it's like a, a, a pocket of exclusiveness that women can't, you know, seem to find them a way to penetrate. And especially in um, women feeling that, uh, I, I think it was, it was an Uber that had like dudes doing push-up contests with each other. And some woman wrote, um, a, a, you know, like a, a basically a, um, she sent in a, a complaint about things like push-ups and, you know, men doing push-up contests with each other, et cetera. It was one of the Silicon Valley companies. I'm not sure if it was Uber directly, but I know that it was one of the companies where they were having push-up competitions in the office and it was very distasteful to her. Right. And so, you know, as an Aphrodite... (laughs) That's very Aries, by the way, to have push-up contests in the office. Very Aries. And as an Aphrodite, who, interestingly enough, Aphrodite and Aries, as you mentioned, had ongoing relationships. Um, And and I don't find myself uh, all that attracted to Aries men, but I find myself attracted to them as friends. Um, Like I... uh, I'm I'm more the Aphrodite that likes the Hephaestus, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But um, 
the this idea of uh, this culture and whether or not that's a sign of misogyny. And what's fascinating is that when I go back into some of these sky god archetypes, like the Zeuses and the Apollos and the Hermes, the, I think they're a lot better at treating women in strategic ways that don't make it appear as if they, I mean, there's, there's of course the patriarchy, but men who are more identified with sky gods are they're better sort of seeing the writing on the wall and recognizing when society is shifting. And they're much better playing the game to ensure that they're not being seen as something that would not allow them to orchestrate whatever success that they want to orchestrate. So I'm almost seeing sky gods as um, ensuring that they're not appearing as part of, you know, that bro culture and they are willing to let, you know, sort of like allow men to be taken down. And it's like these sea levels who are like firing guys really fast if there's any, you know, if there's any scandal at all. And that feels very sky god to me. And, and, and I appreciate that there's a shift in culture and I appreciate that um, there's, there's this idea that, you know, we're not going to tolerate things that are unacceptable in the workplace that have to do with, you know, like sort of the, the male and female dynamics. And I, and I, I very much appreciate that that's a very sky God way of dealing with it. And that there, you know, there might legitimately be, um, a reach, you know, reaching out to make sure that they're, you know, they're allowing the Athenas and the Artemises in and that sort of thing. And then I look at Aries Poor Ares, who who really actually was the again the only god that didn't tolerate rape, <laughs> like in a time period where everybody was tolerating rape, it was offensive to Ares to allow that to happen. He never did it himself. He didn't allow his daughter to be raped. Um, he had uh, almost a more re- kind of almost respect for women in some ways, not just a protective nature. But also, he had a very live and let live with women. He didn't really see them as, you know, um, as people to be exploited. And at the same time, he didn't really have a lot in common with them either, for the most part. And the only time that Ares really, you could see that he had sort of this, um, this like this icky relationship with women was whenever he felt judged by Athena. When Athena was judging him, that did not go over well with him. But with the exception of the Athena energy that was judging him for not being like Zeus, he actually had a pretty open, you know, feel for most of the the women he was in relationships with, the women he was in friendships with, his daughters, etc. It's just he didn't have that much in common. And so he had a tendency to be more associated with men, right? Like men that he wanted to hang out with. And so when I see things like push-up contests in the bro culture what's there's an automatic association with that and misogyny and I I don't know if I see that personally I don't know if I experience that same automatic association now of course I'm speaking as an Aphrodite who has a tendency to be a little bit more sort of I don't know open to both sides right like um, Aphrodite has a tendency to sort of uh, to, to be as open with women as she is with men and kind of see them as sort of equal and Um, not really uh, sort of insert herself into a lot of these dialogues as much, kind of sees it from an outside perspective. But from an outside perspective, I wonder if sometimes we take Aries cues as being more misogynistic than they actually are. I think they said, I think they can be. I think if an Aries has been surrounded by Athena's, I think an Aries can get very misogynistic. But if an Aries has been surrounded by Aphrodite's, I don't think he's a misogynistic hardly at all. I think he's a very like he's he's very generous in his opinion of women. He just doesn't have that much in common. And so when he's doing dude things, it's not a sign that he's trying to be exclusive. It's a sign that he's trying to get that physical affection, right? That that um that sensory affection that he's been looking for that he doesn't know how to access but has been dying for and he still feels like he's in a jar. Does that does that make sense? I know that you probably aren't going to speak a lot to this, Joel, because I'm not sure if you see the same perspective that I do. I can I can see some of what you're saying, but it's like uh, I I sometimes wonder if we're uh, we're too hasty to call bro culture when it's sometimes just um, an Aries man who's trying to get that physical affection, you know, and like sort of uh, like like having a, a, a con- like a push up contest probably doesn't sound like love to other people. It's more like connection than affection, I would say. Yeah, but they're sometimes they're the same for people. Yeah, yeah, I can see like he almost wants uh the affection is like punch your buddy in the arm and like push on them or like yeah, slap people in the back like it's a slap in the back punch in the arm kind of affection. It's yeah. not super touchy-feely huggy. It's more like, you know, put your arm around your bro while you're like 
playing soccer and like you're in the huddle, like the, the think about the, uh, the football athletes that do the, uh, you know, the huddle up and they put their arms around each other, kind of like this bro going into battle stance in a way. Yeah. And I don't think it's intended to like, I, I don't think it's intentionally ex- exclusive of women. I think it's just, um, I think it's something that is kind of hard to understand um, from an outer perspective. And and I and I think, by the way, I think that there are many times when female archetypes are gathered in groups and men see what they're doing as being, you know, misandrist. And really, it's like, like I could see men thinking Artemises are misandrists because Artemis has a tendency to just want to hang out with her nymphs and kind of be away from men. And I could see that being suspicious. It's like, no, Artemis just wants to hang out with nymphs and like go, you know, run with the wolves and howl at the moon and be an archer. Like that's just part of what she is, right? She just doesn't have a lot of a lot in common with guys. And so she doesn't particularly enjoy hanging out with them. She wants to be independent spirit and run with the nymphs. And so I think this is kind of like Aries version of that. So when I'm looking at these archetypes, a part of what they've done for me is they've helped me see things through a more generous lens that sometimes or most of the time when we're doing things, we're oftentimes doing them because we have a need that's been going unmet. And it doesn't always have to necessarily mean something ill intended. And I think I've had not a very positive perspective of Aries men. Like I didn't know they were Aries men. They were Aries archetypes. I didn't know that. I I think I also, because I come from sort of a sky god past, my, you know, my family's very sort of sky god oriented and I come from a very patriarchal, very patriarchal sky god past and um, with the religion I grew up in. And so I also had like a negative view of Aries. But going through this chapter on Aries, really helped me understand that there are um, there's a lot of rejection that Aries faces because he isn't he doesn't fit in those cultures and so the general rejection that he gets has him wanting things that when he when he evidences them can again sort of stack more rejection on top of him stack more ill intent on top which actually might just be him trying to find a way out of his jar so to speak so I had like a more um, I think I had a lot more of a positive perspective of Aries than I had, had in the past when before I, I probably would have gone more Athena and gone they're just hot-headed guys who are misogynistic when really they actually have a pretty they have a pretty positive view of women as a general rule as long as they don't feel too judged but they have a generally positive view of women they just have more in common with other men because there's that warrior ethos. You talk about this rejected nature of Aries. And I hesitate to go down this road, but I'm going to because I think it's a good example in real life to see how this plays out. Um, I look at the 2016 elections here in the United States that most people have a reference point for. So you look back at 2016, I think there were a lot of uh, Aries men who felt rejected by society, by the big business elements of New York and the big government business or the big government of Washington, D.C. and this cerebral or uh, almost intellectual bent that they felt was oppressing them as men. And they felt like marginalized. They were more maybe physically oriented to do work and to labor and to do things that are athletic. And they look at the people in power, almost the Zeus's and Apollo's in power and some of the Athena's in power and they go, oh, this is distasteful. I don't like this. And then a candidate comes along in that election cycle and says, listen here, Aries men, we don't have to stand for this anymore. We can rebel against the establishment. We can drain a swamp. We can target and go after those big businesses and that big government that's oppressing us, the Apollos and the Zeuses and the Athenas of the world. And here there's a candidate on the other side who's an Athena woman candidate propped up in front of these Aries men. And of course, they're going to look at this, you know, again, just zoom way out to archetypes. They're going to vote against this Athena woman character and vote for someone who seems to have their interest at heart to get them back to their their normal life of laboring, being active, being athletic, whatever it is that they they see themselves as. And you can see a lot of a lot of men going down the road of voting that direction because I think it spoke to them, feeling marginalized and cast off of Mount Olympus. If you looked at Washington, D.C. as Mount Olympus, they feel cast off and unappreciated and untaken care of. And so they respond to a message of, listen, we can storm the gates of the castle as warriors and take back what is ours in a way. And I think that that perfect storm was why we had the emergence of the 2016 elections. Regardless of your political persuasion, 
I think it would be very difficult to not see that aspect of it. You might identify with the Aries side, or you might identify with the Athena side, or any of these other different sides or these different perspectives. But I think that's kind of what happened in that election cycle. Mm, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I could totally see that. And also, what's interesting is that it did feel very impulsive. <laughs> that entire, like the entire campaign, all of the messages, all of the things stated, all the promises, all felt very impulsive. And, um, and maybe not as strategic, right, as um, a sky god would have been. I think the previous president of the United States was more of an Apollo. He's more of a sky god, you know, sort of the, the favored son um, archetype. And then here comes the Aries, the not favored son, but with this powerful, impulsive message. The outcast. Yeah, the outcast. And, and what's, what's interesting about that, too, though, is that there's also a lot of Aries that are on the other side. And you could see how they got really bent out of shape, too, right? They, they're they now pushing really strong for the other side in a very Aries way. And what's interesting is that there's a... Um, there's kind of a there's an Aries part of a social justice piece as well, almost like um, the Artemis social justice piece, which is that independent, you know, make sure that there's a protective, you know, like we're protecting the people we need to protect. Aries also comes with that. So it's almost like Aries in a different place in his life. The Aries that has felt, you know, sort of judged by the Athena and judged by Mount Olympus and the sky gods and just wants to have like an impulsive like, yeah, let's break out of our jar and just do it. There's that side. And then there's also the Aries that feels like they, the Aries that has a specific, you know, demographic they want to protect. And then that Aries can be quite, you know, like if we're, if we're looking at a more conservative bent for the Aries that went for the political candidate, the Aries with a more liberal bent is more of the, 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 you know, the social justice piece um, that feels like it's important to protect the, the underdog and, um, and making sure that they're getting representation. So you see these archetypes all over political spectrums and you see them all over the place. Um, and you also see them in, you know, the Silicon Valley bro culture piece, right? Like it's like they're all over. You see them as athletes. You see them as, um, you know, as actors and, and sports figures. You see them as the person who, you know, may just be now in trouble for beating up their girlfriend. And you see them on the other side arguing that it's absolutely wrong to hit a woman and like you know like the like feeling that that's the worst thing that you can do so it's just that that fascinating sort of archetype of the protector and at the same time the um the hunt at the the gate does it make sense it's like there's almost like a dualistic perspective to Aries and uh and finding your finding himself within all of that is the path of growth for Aries are we ready for growth yeah, I was just going to say a couple of the challenges, though, that Aries does struggle with, and then we can go right into growth. Uh, because, like you mentioned, there can be some abusive nature to Aries, depending on how he grew up. You know, that energy came came to be. Also, work-life balance can be a challenge because of the impulsiveness. And uh, sometimes that impulsiveness can disrupt things in life. And then there's a, there's a, a, a temptation or a pull sometimes towards substance abuse or alcoholism. Because again, feeling, wanting to feel intensity, feeling uh, emotions, and sometimes dealing with strong emotions can lead to using substance to help get through something that's very intense for an Aries character. And if they're not careful, they can become dependent on that substance to then augment their feelings, to be able to deal with life or deal with their feelings. So these are just some things. And then also uh, infidelity or having um, having children out of out of a, a sustained relationship, you know, maybe cheating on their spouse and having a rogue child over here that they weren't expecting because again of that passionate in the moment nature. Sometimes these can pop up for Aries, not all, but sometimes these can be things that are challenges for Aries in their life. The more an Aries archetype man has experienced the rejected nature of Aries as a child, the more likely they are to have impulsive thoughtless decisions as an adult so if they were scapegoated as a child if they had a lot of like the, the twins that bullied him and put him in a jar if they had a lot of scapegoating it, or excuse me if the Aries had a lot of scapegoating if he had if he was um there was a lot of unmet expectations for other people that they tried to push him into like an Apollo or a Hermes frame if Aries felt a lot of like he's unacceptable and of course, again, there are women who have Aries as their animus. And so a woman could also be this sort of the precocious, impulsive child who doesn't feel like, I mean, she, she's more likely to have not had the message that her emotions are wrong, but she could have had the message that her 
um, her physicality, like her impulsiveness was wrong. Like if she was called, you know, ADD or ADHD, um, just like the Aries boy, if they had a lot of messages that how they showed up was just unacceptable, it's too energetic, too much, you're overwhelming everybody, that you're too precocious, the more messaging that the Aries archetype got that way, the more likely they are to do things like have substance abuse issues or to have, um, you know, like infidelity issues, uh, to have issues with impulsiveness, um, to, to not to not be able to think through things because they have a, an affectation of being in their head, but they're not. They really need to be more in that kinesthetic and that emotional place. That's where they make their best decisions. So the affectation of being in a cool, sort of uh, rational place, all that does is sublimate everything and get them more disconnected with how they're actually feeling, how their subjective experience is impacting them. They become less um, sympathetic to other people because they're not sympathetic to themselves that they're constantly trying to push down. And so um, if you are an Aries archetyped man or if you believe that this might be your animus as a woman, then it's really important to get into that emotional space to, to give yourself permission to feel your experience, to not constantly be pushing down your experiences from the past and, and like wanting to sublimate all of that emotion. Um, it's really important to get into that, what we'd, what we'd call in cognitive function terms, an introverted feeling or authenticity space. Uh, Apollo, one of his dictums was know thyself. Super important for Aries men to make sure that they're going into an introspective place where they're getting in touch with their emotional experience, having ways to talk about it with other people if that's part of it, uh, having ways to physically express through dance or art or um, you know, through sports or whatever it is to get in your body and know that you have permission to be there, to permission to be in your bodies and in your emotional experience. Because Aries is so kinesthetic and so expressive in a physical way, one of the access points for this to get in touch with other aspects of yourself as an Aries man is to slow down. So use that kinesthetic physicality and get more slow. Slow everything down, bring things, you know, use pauses, slow things down, just bring that physicality to a more slow pace. And this will give you an access point to enter into some of those emotional or cerebral places that will help round you out as an Aries man so that you're not just acting, acting, acting all the time. You stop and pause at periods of time, small periods of time, or you're just moving a lot slower. So then your true essence can start coming out with slower movement. Now you can start to think about the impact that your decisions and actions are going to make in the outer world. You have room and space now to think a little bit ahead and think about the future, think about what's coming down the road, and life stops happening to you, and then now you are starting to take control of what's happening in your life because you're slowing the entire process down. So I would believe that slowing down is the best access point for an Aries man to start with. Now, Berlin mentions getting into Hermes and Apollo as paths of growth for Aries, but I think one of the challenges is that if an Aries man is told too much to be like the, the sky god or the thinker god types, then it might push him out of getting in touch with that emotional space. But I do believe that the Hermes element of articulation, the messenger god, god piece, might be very good for Aries in terms of expression. Aries men have a tendency to have trouble expressing themselves and so they can't diffuse situations that could lead to violence and they don't ha they have trouble just articulating how they feel. So Hermes as a god of as a messenger god as a god of communication can actually be very good for um, for Aries in the sense that he releases him from the jar. He gets him out of this sort of emotional and psychological prison by being able to express. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be in the same way that Hermes would express. Hermes is very articulate. That's one of his number one traits is Hermes men are incredibly articulate. And it's not that an Aries man needs to have the same kind of articulation, but he needs to find a way to self-express, however that looks. Whether that looks like a physical thing, whether that, again, looks like dance or art or fighting or whatever. 
Or it could just be having a Hermes like a person in their life help draw them out and help put into language the things that they're having difficulty expressing. So it's it's important to to either bring the Hermes out inside of yourself or find a Hermes character, maybe a therapist or a confidant or somebody who can help you get that expression that might be difficult for you to find. A lot of it's not skill. A lot of it's permission for you as an Aries man. So a lot of the... Uh, articulation or the ability for you to speak out what you're feeling comes from a lack of feeling like it's okay to do is because again looking toward the Zeus Athena it's suppress your feelings be logical and linear and rational and to talk about the things you're feeling you don't have a lot of permission around that now there might be some skill you need to build as well but really permission is probably what you're going to need to build or the Aries man in your life needs to build because it's going to allow them to express what they're feeling I would say that a, a great tool is the book Nonviolent Communication, which is all about stating how you feel and how you'd like to feel in a very simple way for other people to understand. So I think if you are an Aries man that's struggling with this, would like to more permission and, the, and a tool to help you do that, or if you have an Aries man in your life, I think that would be a great tool to access the ability to articulate how you're feeling and what's going on for you to another person. And Two final thoughts on this for Aries before we move on to Hephaestus is um, as far as, you know, development and growth, Athena could, Athena was a difficult character for Aries because Athena was very judgmental of Aries. And yet, interestingly enough, one of Athena's favorites in the Trojan War, who was Achilles, was actually a very Aries-like character. Achilles could be considered an Aries archetyped man. And when he was um, when he was in the battle, and Agamemnon, who was the commander of the Greek forces, exerted his authority off the battlefield and took Achilles' mistress away from him. Achilles wanted to basically kill him. <laughs> he was like he was gonna go get him, and Athena intervened and made sure that he wouldn't. You know, he didn't murder him or commit mutiny basically by killing Agamemnon. And so it was Athena's voice that chilled Achilles out. And Ares can see that Athena voice in one of two ways. It, Ares can either see an Athena voice as being judgmental and hard on him and calling him names and self-critical, or he can see Athena as almost like a motherly voice, like a voice that of conscience, a voice of like, hang tight, think through your decisions, etc. And what's fascinating is that oftentimes for an Ares man, his conscience has a woman's voice. Like he'll think in terms of a woman's voice when when it's like a chill out moment. And it doesn't have to be like a soft, you know, like that concept of the soft, sweet, loving voice. It can be like an assertive, maternal, but Athena strategic voice inside of him that goes hang tight, think through it, etc. So for a lot of Aries men, Athena is actually their anima. It's an Athena anima that a part of is the resistance because we have a tendency to resist our anima and animus. But if an Aries man can stop resisting his anima, and if it is an Athena voice, he can integrate that and make his anima the thing that helps him think through things and kind of calm down in a moment that he gets hot headed, not feeling judged, but actually seeing it or hearing it as a voice of wisdom. Yeah, I would uh, piggyback off that and say from an anima standpoint, internally in you as an Aries man, or if you're an Athena listening and you have an Aries man or men in your life, the the biggest thing you want to avoid is using name calling as a tool. This is the like, if you're an Athena woman and you call an Aries man or a group of Aries man deplorables or something like this, like a name, that's not going to go over well. That's not going to build a lot of consensus there. So what you'd want to do is is try to offer constructive criticism or constructive feedback without name calling. The name calling won't work very well. And if this is your anima, you don't want to be self name calling in your own Aries psyche, right? You want to you want to use direct language about addressing the issue at hand and not marginalizing with names. That was the biggest thing that Aries had umbrage with around Athena is calling him terrible names and belittling him with those names, you know, humiliating him with those names. Right. And Athenas have a tendency to want to do that because it doesn't make sense to Athena. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's that's a big one. So if you have Athena as an anima, make sure that your, your anima, your Athena anima is not name calling yourself. Absolutely. 
The other piece is that when Aries is allowed, if when he allows himself to develop over time, become seasoned over time, become smarter, think through, th- think through things and slow everything down and become a more mature version of himself, Ares went from being one of the least respected gods in the Greek pantheon to being one of the most respected gods in the Roman pantheon. So he changed over time. And his relationship, when he when he allowed himself to change according to the culture and um, and was less of a hothead, quote unquote, and more of a protector, he he actually eclipsed Apollo. Apollo with the Greeks was the number one god next to Zeus, and Ares was the number one, or um, uh, he became Mars for the Romans. He was the number one god next to Jupiter or Zeus. And so if an Ares man lets himself mature over time and become more of a protector vibe, has more of a, a less less of a I'm a reject. I'm a reject, right? And I need to, you know, I need to stamp myself down or I need to like get mad about it or I I need to let everybody know they can't do this to me and instead moves into more of a protector frame and more of a how can I serve frame? How can I use my skills to help those around me? Um, Then he, then an Aries man becomes quite celebrated and very much has a place, very much has a place in society. So let's shift over to Hephaestus. The God of the Forge. So this is a craftsman. He's an inventor. He's also a loner. He doesn't really have a lot of relationships or hang around a lot of people. He's off by himself. He stays in his underworld workshop. Crafting alone is basically how we come to meet Hephaestus. He's known by his club foot. He's, he has a, a club foot which gives him a hobble when he walks. And he is also one of the rejected sun gods. Uh, basically cast away from Mount Olympus, rejected. And in the midst of his rejection and his underworld workshop, he is a creative genius. So he's forging things, he's creating things, he's a craftsman, and he's very talented at creating in the underworld and then bringing those creations out to give to the rest of the world. One of the etymology stories that Bolin talks about in his book is Hephaestus being born as a from from a virgin birth from Hera. So the story as Bolin talks about is Hera was very jealous that Zeus was able to birth Athena from his head. If you remember Zeus had a splitting headache and Athena was born from his head. Well, in the story Hera wants to do the same thing. Kind of a I'll show you I can do this too. And so she basically has a virgin birth and Hephaestus is the child she has. But when Hera has Hephaestus, he has this club foot. He is deformed in her mind. And she's embarrassed by this. So she rejects him and casts him off of Mount Olympus, where he lands into the sea. And he's raised by two sea nymphs who help him build his ability to craft. And he ends up crafting jewelry at the start, becoming a craftsman of jewelry, raised by these two sea nymphs. As far as his ethos or how he shows up with energies, this archetype, crippled is one of the markers of Hephaestus. So this idea of being broken or crippled. It could be physical or it could be in an energetic way. There's something that is a, a difficulty, like a thorn in the flesh, a thorn in the side of some sort that is difficult for him. He has a difficulty with something that he feels is a deficiency or is a deficiency in him. Uh, Hephaestus is marked by being very misunderstood, rejected, and cheated out of what is his. So Hephaestus was often cheated on by his wife, uh, Aphrodite, and he was left out not really realizing what was happening. He was uh, humiliated and cheated upon and basically cuckolded by his wife in a lot of ways. He was known with to have subterranean fire, feelings that would boil under the surface. This notion, this image of feelings that would boil and boil and boil, but were never actually realized or expressed outwardly very much. He kept his feelings to himself and he would just introvert them and let them just churn. And yet he had a pining nature. He would pine for things. And in fact, he often would pine for things that were impossible to possess or have. So he would pine for people or things, objects maybe of his desire or women of his desire. He would pine for them. And almost the pining was a fuel for his inner fire. It would, he would use that to fuel his creativity. He would f- use that to fuel his essence by that pining nature of something he couldn't actually have. 
He was also known as the family peacekeeper. So he'd show up and be the one that would help create reconciliation or peace in the family. And like I said, he was often marked by all of the people that would reject him and cheat on him and treat him poorly in his life. Yeah, his relationship, I think, with Aphrodite is really fascinating. Um, His relationships with Aphrodite and Athena are both super interesting. But his relationship with Aphrodite is interesting in the sense that, as we mentioned in the podcast um, episode where we talked about her, she didn't. She was. She she wasn't forced into marriage like a lot of the vulnerable goddesses were, um, or you know, tricked into it. Aphrodite got to choose who she was going to marry, and she chose Hephaestus. Interestingly enough, her long-standing relationship was with Ares, and the two of them had you know fathered like four different children and had a very long-standing relationship. And it wasn't that Hephaestus didn't know what was going on. In fact, he was pretty sure he knew what was going on, and he trapped them. He created a net to trap them, and he succeeded. Um, and and Ares kept showing up when he when Hephaestus went to his workshop or went to work because Hephaestus was the only god that worked. <laughs> he was the only one that had a job. <laughs> and so uh, he suspected that Ares would show up when he was going off to his workshop. So he created a net to trap them and he succeeded. And then he showed that he had, um, that he had caught these lovers when he was gone and, and presented them to Mount Olympus and all the gods and goddesses in Mount Olympus laughed at him. So he was smart he was an excellent designer. He could trick people. He he had like basically kind of some of the um, some of the uh, ingenious qualities of Hermes, but as opposed to Hermes, who could talk his way out of situations. And when he was, you know, when he trapped people or tricked them, he was celebrated for it, or at least at least tolerated. When Hephaestus did the same thing, he was rejected and he was laughed at. So one of the challenges with the Hephaestus character and Hephaestus archetype is that they're smarter than they come than people give them credit for. They're they're more handy than people give them credit for. Uh, they they're cra- they're beautiful craftsmen. He not only created great works of art, he also created automatons and brought them to life. Uh, one of the stories about Hephaestus was that he was the one who designed um, uh, Pandora. And he, he was able to create Pandora, who was deceitful and had this box, right? He was, Pandora was the first woman, according to Greek mythology, as a, um, as a punishment for mankind. They created Pandora. And when man, who was seduced by Pandora, opened her box, it, um, it, it let, let out all of the, the evils of the world, right? And all of the problems of the world came from that box. But it was because Hephaestus designed something that was so seductive, they couldn't say no to it. And so, um, you know, all of the implications of that story aside, <laughs> um, so sort of uh, uh, the, that was that one's definitely in the patriarchy, I think, is that all women are the source of all the evils of the world. <laughs> but that story and its implications aside, the point is that Hephaestus was able to create something that was so seductive. Hephaestus created these automatons that were th- that there were uh, women of beauty that helped him in his workshop and helped him get his you know deal with his life. Um, and so Hephaestus was a genius. He was a complete and total genius. But because of his you know because he was crippled, uh, because of his club foot, because of because of his rejected nature by his parents. Um, by Hera, and then his, basically what you could call his adopted father Zeus, right, or his stepfather Zeus, because he came from a virgin birth from Hera. Because of that, he just couldn't get a leg up. He just could not get the respect that he probably believed he uh, deserved. And so like Ares, he sublimated his emotions. He sublimated his emotional experience. It was all under the, under the surface. And because of that, he became sort of like who the gods prayed to when they were trying to keep volcanoes down. It was Hephaestus that was the person who kept the volcano from erupting, even though Hephaestus himself could be considered a volcano ready to erupt. So let's talk about Hephaestus as the man. So if Hephaestus energy is expressing itself in an actual man, maybe it's you listening or somebody you know in your life or somebody you've met in the past, but an actual tangible person, this expressing energy, what does this look like? Often, this man is going to be an intensely introverted man, a loner in school growing up, interested in things and machines over people, 
most likely going to be, you know, this is probably the the young man you're going to find in high school in wood shop or metal shop doing something crafty or making physical things. Or, or like the kid in the back of the class who's drawing perpetually and creating like art in his, you know, spiral notebook. Absolutely. So very much a creator, very creative. And I would say that can be artistic. I mean, can be very expressively artistic. But if you look more at an artisan or a craftsman, somebody that really takes to the craft of something, the particular craft of something, carpentry, metalworking, uh, things like this. I think that you can find this energy showing up in Hephaestus men and young men and boys. Often this, this man grew up being rejected by his parents he, or his family, has a sense of being marginalized and rejected, cast away. There might actually be something physically that is uh, hindering him. Maybe there's a physical ailment of some sort or some physical what... You know, society would deem a deformity or a deficiency, even though you don't have to see it that way. But in some ways, there's something projected onto him that he might be broken. Something's wrong with him. Or he might just be so different from his family. I know a, a Hephaestus character, a, a real man in my life that's a friend of mine who's a Hephaestus, who there was nothing physically wrong with him, but he was the only intuitive in his family of a lot of young, you know, a lot of children in the family, the only intuitive. So he was the odd man out. So it could be an odd man out as well as something actually physically wrong with him. Uh, arts and crafts do help him express, though. As he's growing up, he learns how to express by by going into something that's a craftsman tool, you know, like, like art, carpentry, expression, art, whatever it could be. He's expressing himself through the arts and crafts in some way and doesn't feel like he belongs. He doesn't really feel like, you know, it's not like tons of women are, are giving him attention. Tons of men don't necessarily want to be his friend or seek him out. He's kind of isolated and alone often, but he's a hard worker. He's the only, like Antonio mentioned, he's the only God archetype, the energy that shows up with that intense work ethic. So in the God form, Hephaestus, the, the sun God, was the only God energy that worked. And so when this shows up in a man, he's often a very hard worker and will put a lot of effort and time into something. And even though he doesn't get a lot of attention from women, women do play a significant and important role in his life and in his psyche. And often the significant people in a Hephaestus man's life are women. But he's not good at the romance and the dating game. This is not going to be where he goes to a cocktail party or is good at going up and approaching a woman or talking to women and being very romantic and doing the appropriate or correct romantic gestures to get her attention and to have her fall in love with him, he bumbles his way and has a difficult time with this often and doesn't really feel very comfortable there, can feel very awkward. And so he typically will just avoid those interactions, even though women are important to him and some of the most important relationships he has are women, he doesn't have a good romantic game to fall back on when he's in the dating world. Yeah, and what's what's I think super fascinating about this is that I think women still play a huge part in a young Hephaestus man who's gay um, in his life as well. I knew a Hephaestus young man who was a teenager uh, who was gay, but would almost feel like he was falling in love with really beautiful women because he was so drawn to physical beauty. And so even though he didn't necessarily sexually desire them, he desired their beauty. And so he would want to paint them and draw them. And so it, it's not even so much that women play a huge part in a Hephaestus man's life because of the sexual component, although that, of course, can be there um, if he's not gay. But even if he is gay, women still play a really big part because, um, because we're all drawn to feminine beauty. Like all of us see it and experience it and appreciate it. And so it's, it's almost more like beauty is the thing that is the draw. And if a woman is particularly beautiful, a Hephaestus man might uh, almost desire to possess the beauty element of it to incorporate it into the craftsman element. Um, and this young man was a photographer. And so he really, he always wanted to... Um, not always wanted to, but there was one young woman who was approximately his age that he just really wanted to take her pictures <laughs> because he wanted to see all the different angles. And um, and he was very, uh, like, like he would talk about her like she had freckles all over, like he just loved her freckles and, and he really wanted to capture all of that. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, the other piece is that Hephaestus had two... Uh, two sea nymphs that took him in when he was rejected by his parents, by Hera and Zeus. And the two sea nymphs were his 
original inspiration for designing jewelry for them. So his craftsmanship started out by being inspired by creating beautiful things for these two foster parents who were both women. And so for Hephaestus, women play a big part in his life. And so he usually has sort of a unique appreciation for women because of this association with beauty and craftsmanship and his desire to possess the beauty or at least transmogrify the beauty into something that can be appreciated. You know, in popular culture, as you mentioned, uh, a gay man maybe being very attracted to a woman more for her beauty than the sexual desire. I think of the movie, I mean, it's been probably 15, 20 years ago now, but it was the movie As Good As It Gets. And the gay man character played by Greg Kinnear, is it Greg Kinnear or Craig Kinnear? I think it's Greg Kinnear, right? He plays basically a Hephaestist artist craftsman in that movie. And Helen Hunt, he gets her basically to pose for him. I think he's drawing her picture. I don't think he's, I think he's painting her. And he, they have a really strong connection in that movie. And he desires her beauty and the connection with her. And they have a really shared moment there. It wasn't a sexual moment. But the uh, the main character, I can't remember the guy's name, Jack Nicholson's character, gets really jealous of their relationship, even though he's a gay man and he's not trying to get his woman. They have kind of this this tension point between the two of them. But I think it's a really good Hephaestus example of what you're just talking about, where he's a craftsman and he's making his way through the world, uh, expressing himself through his art, and he has that that relationship with Helen Hunt in that movie. That's a very special and interesting relationship. I can also see, I don't think he's a full Hephaestus, but I think in the first couple seasons, he's painted as almost like a Hephaestus in a lot of ways, is the character of, of Tyrion Lannister, who's the dwarf, or the little person, I guess. He's called a dwarf in the show, uh, in Game of Thrones. And he's always accompanied by women. He's usually in brothels, quite frankly. And he's always accompanied by women, and he's around a lot of women, and women te- tend to be really important relationships for him in his life, and they almost have a caretaking nature toward him. He usually finds himself in relationship with women that are taking care of him in that show. And I think we see him go from a Hephaestus-style archetype energy showing up in him as a, as, a, as a man, and he shifts into other energies later in the show. But I think that's a very... I think he's painted as this... this, this uh, this Hephaestus type club footed character that's broken that basically spends all his time either by himself or in the company of women. Well, in the way that he was rejected by his parents. Yes. And I think that's what's so interesting about the Hephaestus archetype is that Boleyn basically comes out and says that Hephaestus men are made by the rejection of their parents. Right. Like it, it seems like these archetypes are almost emergent from our our natural wiring or maybe our personality types or a bunch of other other components that are more uh, nature oriented in some ways. But it feels like a Hephaestus is very nurture oriented, like the, the rejection of the parents or at least a feeling of rejection of the parents seems to be very tied to the Hephaestus archetype. So Tyrion, who there really wasn't anything wrong with Tyrion. I mean, he, he was a dwarf, but th- I mean, that there was nothing wrong with him, right? Like he just wasn't what his his very Zeus father of Tywin Lannister wanted. And so because he wasn't exactly what Tywin wanted, then he treated him in a rejected Hephaestus style, which made Tyrion go that direction. Had Tyrion not been born a dwarf, it's entirely possible that Tyrion would have been the favorite Apollo son. And Tywin kept trying to make Jaime, who is way more an Ares, kept trying to make uh, Jaime into an Apollo. And he just wasn't. And so Tywin was perpetually frustrated by his children, right? He's got an Athena daughter. He's got an Ares son who he keeps trying to turn into an Apollo. Um, The Athena daughter keeps trying to be the favored daughter. And he, you know, you can kind of tell that he sort of has an ambivalent relationship with her. Like, you know, it's like, well, you're a woman though. So what can I do with you? And then here's Tyrion, who was very much his father's, uh, his father's son. And probably would have been the perfect Apollo had he just not had this like physical thing that Tywin didn't like. And so he sort of forced him into a Hephaestus character. Um, And that wasn't what Tyrion was. Tyrion was not a natural Hephaestus. And so uh, so it's, it's really interesting to see this dynamic, like unlike Succession which is a show where you can, I mean, I, I think the oldest son, what is the oldest son's name? And I can't remember his name because he's kind of this 
nondescript loner character that stays off to himself, right? <laughs> right. And he's, I believe he's a Hephaestus. I would completely agree. And so the oldest son in his, his succession is a Hephaestus, and then the second is an Apollo, and then you got the Hermes, and you got the Athena. And of all of, and the Zeus dad and the Hera stepmom, and you've got like this really kind of perfectly archetypical family, and it's the Hephaestus that keeps getting sort of shoved off screen over and over again. And yet the one that is often trying to make peace with everyone. He's the peacemaker of the family too. And completely besotted with beauty and in into a, in a place where he's willing to create a transactional relationship in order to get a beautiful woman next to his side. And so, I mean, it's just, Succession is such a great show on HBO for showing all these archetypes. And that's, you can tell that that's very much sort of a, uh, like those are all just sort of natural archetypes that fall into place. Whereas the Lannisters are such a great sh um, symbol of these archetypes that are being sort of shoved out of their natural place they're sort of um because of no nobody's where they want to be in the Lannisters like everybody's sort of getting shoehorned into these positions that are not natural to them so it, it's an expression of what happens when people are pushed out of their natural archetype and forced into to things that aren't natural to them and I think I, I agree I think Tyrion was forced into a Hephaestus place which that would have not been his natural tendency so let's talk a little bit about Hephaestus and his sexual energy um, he has a, uh, an intense sexual nature to him that is really channeled. It's turned back into his work. And so, you know, we talk about his relationship with Aphrodite and how Aphrodite basically cheats on him repeatedly. And he still, he still has a, an intense sexual nature, but the, the challenge with Hephaestus is bringing that sexual nature outward. So what he does is he turns it inward. I think of the book by Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. There's an entire chapter there that he writes about sexual transmutation, using your sexual energy for your work and to create wealth in your life. And I think it's a very Hephaestist way of looking at channeling sexual energy back into your creative forces. And so this is almost what Hephaestus did. He channeled it back into himself, and then he used that sexual energy, that intense sexual drive, to create things, beautiful things in the world. He would use it to create all of the craftsmen and forged jewelry and you know creations and products and all these things that he would forge through that sexual energy. So I thought that's a really interesting aspect to him is that he wasn't a loner. He wasn't suppressing his sexual drive. He was taking it, he was amping it, but he was turning it down inward and then expressing it, almost making love to the things he created in a way, if that makes sense. Like he would express the sexual energy through what he made in the world. Yeah, well, there's an entire portion of the Hephaestus chapter where um, Boleyn talks about sort of this idea of um, the parts of you that are quote unquote broken or the parts that Hephaestus sees as being sort of the wounded element of them ends up being pushed into whatever is their craft. So you you mentioned the craftsman piece and I, I do believe that they have a tendency to go towards um, things that are craftsman like but I think it can also be put into things like art and she even has a whole section on medicine that there's a lot of Hephaestus men that go into medicine and into surgery she has an example of a, a Hephaestus surgeon that did uh, I think he was in met um, in surgery for something like 20 hours and like interns and nurses and other doctors are just sort of dropping around him <laughs> you know and they they keep changing shifts and he keeps working um, because he was so so dedicated to the craft of, of being in surgery. And she mentions that it's not uncommon for her fastest men to whatever it is that they perceive themselves to be broken around. And, and again, this is a perception because we're, we don't want to indicate that anybody's broken. Like, yeah, okay, so Hephaestus had a club foot. So what, right? That doesn't make him broken, but he got rejected because of perceived brokenness. And the Hephaestus man has a tendency to internalize the perception of brokenness. And so whatever that is, then they end up sort of re, uh, turning their art into something that addresses the perception of their brokenness. So if they believe that they're not acceptable, then they focus on things that they believe are acceptable, like things like beauty. 
And if they believe that they're not physically well, right, that they're sick somehow, they might turn it into medicine or into, you know, becoming a surgeon or something to that effect. Um, so so Hephaestus has a tendency to do that. And it made me think of the, um, the phrase that is thrown around in personal development circles a lot that your mess is your message. So that's a very Hephaestus way of doing things is looking at the mess of your life and then turning it into something that you can like teach or become a craftsman around um, into a message. I'm glad you said that about medicine and other ways it can express except for, you know, I'm, I'm single-mindedly keep talking about craftsmanship and art, but I think of the show House, Dr. House being the, the brilliant, you know, this genius surgeon who's a loner who basically is a Hephaestus. He even has an ailment in his leg where his deficiency in his leg, he's on painkillers and he hobbles around with a cane. He's a very Hephaestus character. And you can see that intensity that comes out in him and that genius that comes out in him expressed in ways that are through surgery and through medicine that aren't through art or craftsmanship. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, so to piggyback off of that idea is this idea that um, Hephaestus won't be budged because he has chosen to deal with his quote unquote brokenness in his own way and internalizing it and making it sort of a um, like like he's going to handle it inside and internally. He ends up being to some extent quite stubborn when it comes to the outside world. So there's this whole story of Hephaestus creating a... Um, I think it was, I think he created a throne for Hera and she loved it so much that she hopped on it and it was actually a trap. And in one version of the story, it was a trap that he was trying to get the story of his parentage um, or like, you know, his etymology story from her. And so he trapped her until she would, um, until she would tell him. And then he ended up getting ousted because of this. And or, or or maybe he ran off. I can't remember. But basically, he like he he split right while Hera was still trapped. And Zeus sent Ares after him to go get him. And Ares, like with all of Ares' intimidating nature, he is the god of frenzy, right, and bloodlust, right. And he couldn't get Hephaestus to budge. Hephaestus would not follow him back in order to let Hera loose from this throne. But then they sent Dionysus, who's the god of, you know, of wine. And um, and Dionysus just sort of plied him with alcohol. And all of a sudden, Hephaestus is like, yeah, okay, I'll go. <laughs> okay, I'll follow you back. And he ended up completely drunk, riding in on a donkey um, in order to, you know, to handle this thing that he had, he had created. So there's a stubborn streak to Hephaestus that it, it doesn't matter how much power comes at him, right? It doesn't matter how much intimidation comes at him. A Hephaestus will dig in their heels. But alcohol, on the other hand, or anything that's a substance will get Dionysus to kind of open up. And so in his relationships and sexuality, what you were mentioning, the sexuality piece, that Hephaestus ten, tends to have more of a an intense sexual relationship sort of idealistically happening inside him. He might not even communicate that with the person he's in a relationship with, how much is going on for him in those sexual relationships. And what's interesting is she mentions that when it comes to women, he has a tendency to be in relationships with Aphrodite and um, Athena women. And um, and sometimes Persephone's, and I'll get to that in just a moment, but if he's a gay man, it's usually a Dionysus gay man that really kind of uh, figures out how to find an inroad in uh, through things like joie de vivre and alcohol and that sort of thing that they might kind of take advantage of the Hephaestus man. Uh, but those, those are the things that tend to open him up, are beauty, and then on the other side, alcohol. Yeah, so Hephaestus can't be pushed or forced, he has to be coaxed and brought, you know, with a pull mechanism and encouraged. And sometimes I guess that can be done with uh, substance. I think in the, just to kind of finish up the sexual piece, there's a sense of you know, when Hephaestus is making love to his ideas in a way and the things he's bringing in the world, he's very neglectful of his lover or spouse. And I think that's part of the note in the system. He's not just getting cheated on just because there's a sense of Hephaestus not showing up for his lover. So if you're a Hephaestus man, one of the things that you need to pay attention to is, are you being neglectful of the, the woman or man you're in relationship with and ensure that you're not just going off and doing your creative work, but you're also attending to the relationship because 
when that relationship is not being nurtured, now there's an opening for that person to maybe drift energetically. They may not cheat on you necessarily, but they might just drift away and you don't have that closeness that maybe you would desire otherwise. So that's something to just pay attention to in your relationships. And then that other piece of you know Dionysus being able to get Hephaestus drunk and or ply him with wine, I think there's a sense of Hephaestus men, and if you're a Hephaestus man, you probably resonate with this. You probably really enjoy going off with another another guy friend of yours just to have a drink, to connect with them, to just connect, have a drink together. And quote unquote, have a drink doesn't actually have to be alcohol. It could be doing something that you enjoy together that stimulates you in a, uh, an emotional way, or it stimulates the conversation being brought out. So it doesn't literally have to be alcohol. Often it can be, but it could be some other activity or something else that gets you into a rapport with another male friend of yours. And this can be very powerful for you to express how you're feeling, express what's going on for you. And it can be a really interesting relationship for you with another man who can help be a good friend to you. And you're probably not going to be the type of person, if you're a fastest, it's going to have a ton of friends and be you know, in the party scene and be bombastic and crazy, it's probably going to be one or two close friends in your life that have your back that you can go and have a quiet conversation with about what's going on for you. And so nurturing those relationships as well can be very important in your life. The relationship with Aphrodite, that sort of neglectful piece, is not uncommon for Hephaestus-Aphrodite relationships. And so Aphrodite doesn't wait around. Like, if she's being neglected by the Hephaestus that she chose, and Aphrodites can be very attracted to Hephaestus characters because of the meeting of craftsmanship and beauty is what is arguably, the Greeks said, their relationship, their marriage, was the birthplace of art. So Aphrodites can be quite attracted to Hephaestus characters, not just to Ares characters. Those are sort of the two t- archetypes that she's most attracted to. And when she's attracted to Hephaestus, she wants to be his muse. She wants to be there for him. But if he ignores or neglects her, it's very hard for an Aphrodite to stick around and to not have a wandering eye because she wants the intensity of the relationship. And if he's not providing it, then it's hard for her to to, to wait for that. Um, and that said, uh, they have a tendency, if, if a Hephaestus man can be with an Aphrodite woman and stay present to the situation and let her see his passion, then an Aphrodite woman can be very loyal to Hephaestus um, as long as he's showing her that part. The other, the other archetype that he has a tendency to really gel with is Athena. And there's a story of Hephaestus falling in love with Athena and trying to have sex with her. And of course, she's a virgin goddess, so she rejected him um, based on just her status as not being in any relationship with men. And when he tried to make love to her and she fled or pushed him away, his semen fell to the ground and fertilized Gaia or Mother Earth instead. And then out came Erichthonius, who was a child that Athena ended up raising as, um, as her own. And then he became sort of the the beginning of this entire legacy of powerful Athenian kings. So Hephaestus was, an, even though he didn't directly have children, right, with the woman, he did. He was part of a um, a dynasty. He helped the. He was part of the etymology of a dynasty of kings. So Hephaestus characters don't just have to be sort of sad, right, and in the background. They can give help give birth to amazingly powerful things, and in particular when they combine forces with an Athena woman. Uh, Boleyn talks about an artist who had fallen basically muse-like in love with a woman who was not his wife, but he painted hundreds of portraits of her and he was actually married to an Athena woman and when she found out that he had been painting this woman's image over and over and over again for I think over a decade if not two decades then she was just really super happy for him that he had had a muse and she ended up the Athena ended up selling his paintings for over 10 million dollars and the Athena was like look at all the art he's created this is awesome let's go ahead and sell this so she didn't have what was great about the Athena woman is that she was not jealous she didn't have a jealous streak and so when Hephaestus found a muse it was actually her opportunity to help him like help help him subsidize his art by being her art, his art manager. And so actually Hephaestus-Athena relationships can work very well. It almost seems like those are some of the best relationships, not the Hephaestus-Aphrodite ones. It's almost like a Hephaestus has an Aphrodite as a muse, but partners with an Athena and she gets it done for him. And those are some of the best relationships. So when we talk about Hephaestus, there's a little bit of a challenge here with him. 
in that because he's so introverted and because he's got such a nature of what's going on for him subjectively, often Hephaestus men can confuse what actually happened in a situation with how they felt about a situation. So the situation in their mind becomes what their feelings were about it, not the objective reality of what happened. So the interpretation becomes almost the reality for his fastest men. And this could be a challenge because if you're going from your subjective interpretation of a situation, that now, if that's your reality, it's difficult sometimes to interface with the world or other people when that wasn't what actually happened in the outer world, but that's how you felt about it and you feel very strongly about it. And remember, Hephaestus is unmovable if they decide something. They're, you you cannot break through by pushing on them. In fact, the more you push, like Ares found out, the more Hephaestus digs their heels in. So if you're a Hephaestus man, you might find yourself idealizing situations, idealizing things you pine for, idealizing relationships you pine for, and then idealizing or finding the subjective nature of what actually happens in your life. And you're living almost, I don't want to call it a fantasy world because it's not fantastical. It's not a fantasy, but it is a construct in your own subjective psyche about what happened. And this can be a blocking a stopping point. So getting in touch with the objective reality outside yourself is as we start to talk about some growth strategies here, that's one of the big shifts you need to make as a Hephaestus man is to get, get more objective in your life. Yeah, it's we were kind of asking, well, is Hephaestus more like Hades or is Hephaestus more like Poseidon? And I think actually Hephaestus is more like Poseidon. He's more of the emotional son portion because Hades, I would I would attach to introverted perceiving. It's more like an IJ characteristic. Uh, Hephaestus seems to be more like introverted feeling or introverted thinking, maybe even with an emotional bent to it. Um, it's more... IPs that are more likely to be Hephaestus because it's subjective, but then it's like, um, it's like sort of how it struck them and then the decisions they made based on it. And especially if a Hephaestus is an IFP, they're going to have an almost, they're a, a Hephaestus man that's more of an IFP in the Myers Briggs system will have to be very careful not to turn this oppressive to the people around them, very unintentionally oppressive. Because they're going to have such idealism, and an IT man, ITP man can do this too, um, but they're going to have an idealism that they're going to push out on the world, and they're going to expect the world to behave in a way that matches their internal idealism. And if they don't, they're going to get upset. They might unintentionally do this with people they're in relationships with if they end up partnering with a Persephone, and the Persephone might try to be what the Hephaestus man wants her to be, and then he'll, almost like the automatons he created, and then she'll suddenly feel like, well, she's not allowed to be her personality. And so he might unintentionally create an oppressive environment for the per people around him because he's got so much idealism. And so if he doesn't get out of himself and in, out of this introverted place, he's going to be unintentionally judging the world all the time for its inability to match how he feels internally with it. So the growth strategy is to, again, just like Aries needs to go towards Apollo's know thyself, so does Hephaestus. Hephaestus needs to very much be in touch with his emotional experiences and go into those experiences from the past and not just sublimate them and turn them into craft, but also into healing. He needs to be a, a self-healer. And that might mean going and asking other quote-unquote craftsmen like therapists or psychotherapists to help him walk through these experiences in order to be able to express them and not just turn them into physical, tangible things, but also turn them into words, uh, turn them into self-understanding and self-knowledge, not, not just sublimate and repress, 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 and then express through art, but also through actual communication. And then the other piece is to know others. Hephaestus tends to be very self-referential in the sense that he's about himself and the things he's creating and how things are striking him. So putting attention to the outside world and getting to know others is incredibly important. Remembering that other people also have their own subjective experience and also have a sense of idealism that they're trying to bring to the world and to sympathize with that, not just push it away as a potential rejection, but to not pre-reject others, right? to integrate others and also have that energy, have it so that he gets integrated with others. So we have a tendency to do what's been done to us and Hephaestuses can pre-reject because they felt rejected. But instead of coming from a rejection frame, coming from um, an inclusion frame is important. We talked about with Aries finding access points based on his nature. 
And I talked about he's kinesthetic and he's in motion and he's moving. So I talked about using that as the access point, access that and slow down and get in touch with thinking and being careful with thought. Well, with Hephaestus, remember, he's very self-referential. A lot of this is internally focused. And Hephaestus men often are marked by being rejected by their parents. And so there's this need, this is need for parenting. And so an access point for Hephaestus man can be the art of self-parenting. Again, using that self-referential part of themselves is now an access point to get in touch with the, inter, the inner parent inside of themselves and help coax and rewire their mind almost in a sense from that inner parent stance. It doesn't mean don't do what Antonia just said about getting connection with others, more objective what I said, and pushing yourself in the outer world. But I'm just trying to find access points for you if you're a Hephaestus man, because sometimes it's hard to transition from that inner world to the outer world. So one of the access points for you could be to embody more father God archetypes in your own persona and start to grow those and realize, you know, almost embodying a Zeus-like character that can now approve of you internally. So you're approving, you're self-validating from the inside out. And now that gives you an access point to begin to do what Antonio and I have suggested, which is to be more objective outwardly and to make connections with people outside of yourself. So this is, I think, a really good growth strategy as a starting point for you. If you are a Hephaestus man or you've got a man in your life that's Hephaestus, I think this is a good starting starting point. Yeah, I agree. And there are women who can have Hephaestus as their animus, feel that rejected artist part of who they are. And also the same would apply is to self-validate and to find those elements of yourself that you can recognize that um, like it's it's important to remember that you don't have to live with the baggage of the past. And I think both Aries and Hephaestus have the same path of growth, which is uh, not letting the rejected nature from the past be what colors all of the future. Recognizing that this is part of what's forged you, as opposed to the favored sun gods of Apollo and Hermes, which might feel entitled to having sort of an easy ride of it and getting upset when things aren't going right because they're so used to having good initial conditions. And the advice for them is to, th- you know, to see these moments of challenge as, uh, you know, something to be appreciated because it can forge them into becoming better people. It's the it's sort of the reverse or the photo negative for the rejected sons. Uh, for the rejected sons, it's to not feel like your entire life has to be colored by challenge. Allow the challenge to have forged you as the person you are, but remember that you get to set the tone for the rest of it. The condition, the initial conditions might not have been as great for you. You might not have been as integrated into the family or given approval. But now is a time that you can approve of yourself. You can see yourself as a positive influence, as something that, somebody who has a lot to give. Regardless of whether or not the people in your life saw you as amazing as you are, Aries and Hephaestus both have extraordinary, extraordinary characteristics. Ares was a protector. He was the only god that didn't attempt to rape in a time period where rape was just everywhere. I think that says something about him. I think that says something special about Ares that he w- he didn't want to exploit, that he was passionate and uh, and beautiful and had so much to give in that way. Hephaestus, regardless of whether or not anybody acknowledged it, he was a genius. Hephaestus did extraordinary things. I think of modern day versions as the Pablo Picassos of the world that just give this extraordinary art to everybody else. And so it kind of doesn't matter what the opinion of other people were in your life. You get to set the tone from here on out. So just like the forging of fire that Apollo and Hermes need to thank the world for giving them, You can thank the world for that too, for helping you become the extraordinary person you are now and then determining that you're going to reset the tone for everything and you're going to go to a much more positive frame because you are an extraordinary person. So we want to hear from you. You've been listening. You've been part of this conversation, but you haven't been able to talk back. You don't have a microphone on your side. Your microphone is coming over to personalityhacker.com and leaving a comment or asking a question. Let's start a discussion or even share your story directly below this podcast in the comment field. We can have a conversation about these energies. Do you identify with Hephaestus? Do you identify with Aries? Are you seeing these energies show up in your life? If you're a man, maybe you're a woman, this is your animus. What is going on for you? We want to understand your story and hear your feedback. So come over and make your voice heard at personalityhacker.com. You can also join our community of like minds over at facebook.com forward slash personality hacker or twitter.com forward slash personality hack, H-A-C-K. 
And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. If you're feeling particularly giving, you can leave us a rating review on iTunes. That helps us out a lot. And if you would like to help support us and support yourself in your personal development process, you can come check out our catalog of programs. I highly recommend checking out Intuitive Awakening right now. It's a great program and it really helps intuitives to find uh, find those elements of themselves that are special and integrate the positive aspects of yourself as opposed to feeling like a Hephaestus, which might have been the only intuitive in a world that didn't quite understand. Uh, So go check out that or any other program in our catalog to see if it's right for you. My name is Jewel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. Podcast.